So I'm not going to try to pretend it's a normal Sunday. That's why I'm wearing a t-shirt. Um, and my hair is probably a mess. I haven't really looked at it in a few hours, and I, I really don't care. So <laughs> We're not on, like, um, what is it, Daystar Network or something like that. So. In one week, uh, most of our lives have been turned upside down. Like I said, we have projects that we never wanted. We have burdens that we did not cause or invite into our lives. And those burdens really ravaged a lot of our streets. Last Saturday... And we experience this as a community. And the thing about that is what's going on inside of you, it's physical, but it's also spiritual. Your emotions, the loss that you feel, the empathy you share or feel, fear toward, uh, feel towards other people. And this is something that anybody can notice whether you have, even whether you have a relationship with God or not. Religious or not, you, you will experience this in your life. Because when we go through a disaster as a community, something changes, right? Something has changed since last week before this all happened in your life. It's, it's I, I don't know about you, I mean, I, I see it, it's not just me. It, it just makes, it makes you want to go hug people. <laughs> Normally, you maybe would not have hugged all the time before, right? You may have just kind of walked by, hey, hey, good. And now you just want to run and hug people. And that's because the, the trauma, the event, which there's trauma in this, has connected us somehow because we're in the history of it. We're in the actual forming of it as it happens. It's even continuing to happen now in recovery. And that forms something powerful. Every one of us has an individual story. Everybody has it. Every one of us, at some level, you have some kind of trauma. I think that just being born is traumatic. I could be wrong, but I, I think I'm right. But when I, when I share my story, which I, I do, my wife and I, we share our testimonies. It's on the church website. Um, it, it's not possible for anyone else to have the bond of having actually been through what we've been through like it is when you're there, like it is when you're involved in it. Basically, when you, when you hear someone else's story, you're just reading a history book of someone else's life because you weren't there. But when we're all here, it's much different. And in psychology, it's called collective trauma. The devastation that touches a group of people that affects how people act and how they respond. It affects how we live as a group of people, what we go through. And it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. It can be the driver for change in society. When people go through the trauma of, of war or recession, pandemics, earthquakes, and yes, a flood. If we respond the right way, based on how we respond, communities can change because of decisions people are making individually and together as a group. That means, and this is biblical, entire nations can be healed based on how we respond out of trauma. 
So really, it's all about this morning how we respond to disaster. What we do in response to disaster answers the how, but the problem is most people at some point focus more on the why. Why did this happen? Why did this happen to us? Why did my house get flooded and theirs didn't, or vice versa? Why didn't I have flood insurance? And I know many have theories about that. Why didn't I prepare better? I was thinking that, what? I, I, should, have had, I should have been ready. You have all these whys, and they're not always bad, but I don't think that the whys are always productive in our spiritual life. Because when they're unproductive, here's what happens with the whys. There, 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 there comes a point where there's no answer, and you have to find an answer. And in order to do that, what we do as humans, we resort to maybe placing blame. Maybe finding fault. We have to find a reason for what has troubled us in our lives. And if we can't, we're going to blame somebody or something or some system. And the reason for that is knowing why makes us feel like we're in control. And we like to be in control. <laughs> now, faith in God isn't about that. Faith in God does not always have to know why. You, you trust a perfect creator who you cannot see in an imperfect world, which it is, during imperfect circumstances, which we are in, in your imperfect mind, which it is. And I don't know why. And Pastors, and you, you go to clergy, and you go to people who you, you think are going to have the answer, and really, there comes a point where it's arrogant for us to tell you, well, we know exactly why bad things happen to good people. We know exactly why your house was chosen to not be flooded, and theirs was. Maybe we're not supposed to be asking that question. The Bible tells us everything we need to know. And in it, it also says there's a divine mystery that's yet to be revealed in everything we're going through that we cannot figure out. Even why you sit in this seat this morning. The how is what action flows from, and it is ultimately the movement of the gospel the purposes of God, why we're here on this earth, it's found more in the how than the why. In fact, in the Bible, if you counted, you're going to find twice as many hows as whys asked. So it's how we respond. And more than why this has happened, how do we respond to evil? How do we respond to injustice? How do you respond when someone talks bad about you on Facebook? to stress, to desire, to fear, to tragedy. That response, and I'm speaking of a community, not just individually, that, that response shapes and changes things. Now, these aren't my, this isn't like my philosophy class that I just came up with. It's actually all based in the word of God, which I think is awesome. In Deuteronomy 29, 24, we see nations begin to ask why. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done this thus to the land? Why this great outburst of anger? And God gives only an explanation that they need 
Not all of it, because he says, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So God, he, he chooses what he wants to reveal to us for our good. He chooses to tell us what we get to know, and we just have to be okay with that. But in Christ, we can fully understand everything that he reveals to us. Now that's awesome. Later on in chapter 30, God begins to explain how. And here's what he says. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and all your soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God had scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. He asks Israel to return to him, to return to what they were created to be. A group of people who faced disaster, they faced tragedy, they were scattered, they were displaced, like some in this very area are displaced. And the restoration comes through the compassion that God had for them. So that's part of the how. It's how God responded, and, and it's, it's how he taught us to respond. And he lived this out in the flesh. He wanted Israel not only to know his heart, who he is, but to have his heart, to have something they could not have without him, a heart of compassion, uh, mercy, love, all, all those things. And that is, God, that is God's heart when he sees suffering. Every time in humanity, it's It's compassion. In the Hebrew language, the word picture for compassion, it's a deep sympathy or sorrow felt for another who has been struck with affliction or misfortune. And it's also accompanied with, accompanied with a desire to help, which, which is exactly what we, we've, we're seeing now, what we saw this week. So what we saw this week was the attribute of God within our hearts, within people in this community, in their hearts. A character trait, an attribute, a divine aspect of God's personality. It's why we feel closer now. It's why you want to go run up and hug people. Why you're weeping. I've cried more in one week than I have my entire life, I promise you. And I'm okay with that. It's why so many came into this church driven to serve others. It's why so many are probably out there this morning helping fix people's messes, driven to serve others for the most part. I hope, right? But even those without faith feel this. And I just keep this in mind this morning. That's right, non-Christians have compassion. Now it sounds radical, don't, don't. The Bible proves this and that's because Human beings are created in the image of God. Did you know that? You are created in the image of God. 
His attributes are clearly seen. Romans 1.20. And mostly, I, I think we relate this to the sky and, and creation and the flowers. But did you know you're also a creation of God? Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. You're, you're created. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now, this is powerful because we have evidence of God already built within us. It has to be. When we have compassion and love and mercy you are seeing the evidence of God in someone else. But we also have something else that's not so good. We have evidence of a a fall, of a moral failure. We have evidence of sin in our lives. We have dark impulses, evil thoughts, uh, lustful leanings, desires that are not according to the image of God. We also have fear. We have despair, pain, suffering, depression. So how we respond to the evil in our lives and our hearts, it's going to determine the outcome. Ultimately, it determines eternal life. So a a flood or a natural disaster, anything you go through, it's going to drive you to God or away from God. And that's why Jesus came. He came to teach us how. He didn't come to answer all your deep questions. He answered everything we need right now. He came to teach us how way more than the why, and it ties right back to those Old Testament verses. He entered humanity and exposed himself to disaster. He exposed himself to suffering uh, to teach us what to do from a heart of God that's already imagined within us all. Only to be fully awakened when we are restored back to him, and that is what we call salvation or eternal life. And there was a time where Jesus answers a lawyer about this how to have this eternal life. In Luke 10, 25, he says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. He was telling him how to live forever and how to have hope even through despair. He points him back to scripture. And he says, well, how do you interpret that? How do you read that? But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Or, and who is my neighbor? I don't know how he said it, because of course, we would make the mistake to interpret God's word in a way that will justify our sinful actions. And that's exactly what he was doing. He wanted to see with, who could he get away with not loving? Because surely you can't love everybody, right? And what does neighbor mean? Does that mean like just two houses down? Or is that just my block? Or is that just who's in proximity to me at the moment? I mean, how how could we love everyone? There's some messed up people out there. So who is a neighbor? Jesus doesn't directly answer. Instead, he tells a story or a parable. Verse 30, Jesus replied, 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, uh, pouring oil and, and wine on them. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and, and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Well, he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do, uh, you go and do likewise. So basically, he turned the question back on him. It was about his heart. He, he showed him what makes us see every person as our neighbor, not just who we choose to see as our neighbor. And it's right in here, or here really, right? It's not about who deserved it. Everybody deserves it. Everybody, everybody deserves to be loved. Everybody be de- deserves to have compassion poured out on them because they're, simply because they're made in the image of God. And, and suffering and tragedy and, a, and, a, and a major flood for us here now, this collective trauma that we're in and we're experiencing together. I hate it and I love it. I, I was in the parking lot, and a very manly man came up to me and began to speak with me, and I just lost it. I started weeping, and he, he embraced me in his arms. And once I got past my pride and the embarrassment, I said, thank you, Lord, because this is what we are. And that's because collective trauma, what we're in, you want to say, how could anything good come out of this? Well, well, there's a lot, but I know it doesn't feel that way right now for many, but it brings the open door for compassion. It brings that open door for the how. And who we really are is a people where humanity loved by a compassionate Savior. He looked at us. He felt so sorry for us. He wept for us. For our pain, even the, even the pain we brought upon ourselves and the pain we didn't bring upon ourselves. He lived among us. Jesus lived among us and was displaced with people. He went through loss. He went through disaster. And he responded through all of it with the compassion of the heart of God that only wants to see us whole and healed and restored to him in the end. Now, this is the mission of the church or the body of Christ. And I don't mean one building. Please. It's hard to do things like this and not be accused of promoting your own church So we've gone out of our way to make that clear. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they're just doing this to build their brand or their church or something like that. Well, my definition of church is the body of Christ. And I've said it here before. When Jesus returns, he only comes for one bride. So, I mean, it's not multiple wives. The mission of the church, which many only equate to evangelism and uh, church attendance, 
or the preacher on stage preaching the word. That's the mission. It's, it's evangelism. And we got to get out and we got to just get, get, the, get the tracks in people's hands, get the gospel, uh, let them hear the gospel. And all that is good. It's important. But there's another aspect of the great commission, the mission that cannot be separated. And that aspect is, well, it's compassion. Or we call them compassion ministries now. And, and it's times like these, ironically, not ironically, it's tragedy that brings it out the most. How many compassionate ministries are in this town right now? I can think of three, at least. And really, this is where miracles happen. So seven times in Matthew, we see the word compassion mentioned to the distressed around them, the, the dispirited, to our enemies, those who seek to uh, harm us, compassion to them also, to the sick or those suffering physically, to those without food and shelter, compassion, to those, our debtors, those who owe us money. That's a hard one, right? You owe me money. You know what? Compassion. Those unable to see uh, physically and spiritually blinded. And I, and I find it interesting when we talk about healing. Of course, I've been, I believe in divine healing. I, I've seen miracles. We, we often equate healing the sick only to this. Coming up in an altar service, laying hands on, a, on the sick, and seeing an instant miracle. Or through, through a prayer that, that brings something that brings a lot of fanfare, maybe like in a tent revival setting. But here's a question for you. Didn't the Samaritan cared for, the, the person that the Samaritan cared for, didn't they receive healing? Did, I mean, did they? You bet they did. And it cost that Samaritan time and money, and he asked nothing in return, no fanfare, no offering, because he was moved with compassion, and healing happened. Let me tell you, healing has happened even in this place. Healing has happened throughout our town in, in what, what's happened in relationships and caring for people. It's not always an instant, dramatic miracle. Christ has compassion for us, knowing he knows perfectly the heart of God more than we can ever understand. Jesus walked on our roads. He walked on earth. He, he saw disaster all around him. And he did the same thing many of us do. There are certain roads that I cannot drive down in this town now without weeping. And that did not happen before. Trauma, yeah. Compassion, yeah. This is the same thing Jesus did. And our collective trauma is humanity. It's sin. So it's the results of it. Not even necessarily our sin all the time, just the results of it. It's just the world we live in. It's a great human tragedy we've all been through. And he came to a people, a community that was traumatized by their sin and the state of the world and injustice and all these things that we try to fix through all of our means when he perfectly understands it all. And he's teaching us what to do through tragedy right now. So Jesus sees all this, and he does something strange, which I don't think any of us would do. Would you choose to, like, go through what you went through last Saturday? Would you choose to say, you know what? I'm going through that. Of course not. Jesus chose to enter into a collective trauma, our trauma, our pain. Now, Another question would be, would you choose to go back and go through that again if it meant that you could save every house, every life? Would you have chosen to go through that again? 
And I think with compassion we would say, yeah, you bet I would. If it meant that. So that's the kind of heart that Jesus served out of. And he cared for the sick and he fed the hungry. He restored relationships, all healing, spending time with the outcasted and the displaced. Spending time with people who smell. All of us smelled this week. We might still smell. I think we're, we got some showers going now, but... Healing many physical bodies, he did that, of course, but most of all, he cares for the heart, our souls, not just one, but every single one of us. Because he was here to, here to heal a people, a people collective, a body, a community, not just one body part. He wanted to heal a people, meaning he wanted to restore a people into a right relationship with God. He wanted to heal nations, Revelation 22, not just a single nation. That's been his plan all along. That includes restoring us to one another. And that's seeing every single neighbor, meaning every single person that you meet, as a neighbor, as someone loved by God, by being a good neighbor yourself. <laughs> Jesus went so far, he actually died for us. He dealt with the penalty, the, the, the curse, the pain, so that we wouldn't have to suffer it forever. He rose from the grave and commanded us to continue what he started, and then he pours out his spirit on all mankind, on all flesh to help us live out and understand what to do, to live out the how instead of spending all this time trying to figure out the why. It's just not gonna happen. He has all the whys. We have to trust like a child, a child to a parent. And when you know who he is, this Jesus, this Christ, the only true God who would enter into our pain and our trauma and die for it to be healed and restored. When you know him, it's less about the reason bad things happen, and it's more about how to walk through them. And see his purposes carried out. So, so how do you know him? How do you know if you know God? You may ask. Well, it starts in, it starts in, in, in the compassion and the love as we serve each other right now. You can call it outreach, you can call it humanitarian aid, you could call it convoy of hope or Samaritan's purse. But it is the heart of God. And, and when you see that, you'll, you will see it in other people treating and caring for each other as the neighbors they are created to be. Jesus still says to all of you, searching for real life, he's saying basically just, just go and do likewise. Do exactly what he did out of that kind of heart, seeing a neighbor as yourself and loving them like that. And this community has already started it. Spencer is full of compassion. And I, I love it because people are compassionate and loving and, and caring. And it, it's only gonna draw them into relationship with God based on how they come out of that or based on how someone, another neighbor, explains to them this is why you have that in you because you're made in the image of God. And he wants you to fully understand why that's in you, that desire to serve. But we're not fully restored by any means. There's a lot of work to do physically and spiritually, and the only way to be part of both, both of the cleanup efforts now is to know the one who directs them all. So I'll ask you, do you know him this morning? This, this would be the evangelistic part of it, right? Do you know 
him this morning. Do you understand that what you're going through and, and those, those, those emotions you go through inside and everything, how you react out of pain, Jesus understands it. It's not just God, distant, cold, Russell Crowe, Noah style. He came like so close, so personally. He, he, he was in, like in your basement working, helping you recover that close. That's how much he understands you. And all he wants to do is just run up and give you a hug. And he wants to know you and, and say, I love you. And you receive that relationship that he, he wants to establish with you. So if you just close your eyes this morning. Come on. This Jesus I'm talking about. He'll take an already pretty compassionate person. I was a compassionate atheist. I still cared about people. But man, I didn't understand why. And I didn't understand what to do with it. One of the best answers you can have through a relationship with Jesus Christ is knowing why you were put here on this earth. That is one why you get to know. You were put here to reflect the image of a compassionate, loving God to a world that is broken and hurting and going through pain and trauma every single day. And this is but a taste of all the stories in the room combined of what we go through as humanity. And the only answer is a restoration, a relationship with Jesus this morning. So I'm not asking you It's the Spirit of God. It's what Jesus left when he descend, uh, ascended and poured out his Spirit. It's what he left to comfort us and guide us, even into truth this morning. So that means that same Holy Spirit is here, something you can't see or necessarily feel. But in your mind, in your heart, he's drawing you. And you're, you're like, there's something about this. There's something about this. This guy, you know, he's talking right to me, that kind of thing. And he has compassion this morning for you. And he's drawing you in by his spirit. So with your eyes closed, you're aware of that. You need help. You don't know how to respond. You want to understand what to do. You want a real relationship with the living God. If you want that this morning, just raise your hand real quick. I'm just, it's just totally me looking. And I probably will not remember every hand. Just an acknowledgement that God is speaking to your heart. That's great. Listen, I'm not going to lead you in a sinner's prayer. This is something with, it's something with, between you and God, and just, just talk to him. Just begin to ask him, you know, we make it really complicated. I know my wife and I, we basically just said, well, God, if this, if this stuff's all real, please just help me understand, <laughs> or show me that you're real somehow, and it's not the way you may want, but he's going to show you. And that might very well be through other people as you are helping people this coming week recover their lives from disaster. 
because that's exactly what he's trying to do for you this morning. He's trying to recover your life from the disaster of everything to one day fully restore it, and that's awesome. So this morning, I'm just gonna pray over you. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for every neighbor in this room, Lord. Thank you that you, you made us in your image, that you created us to love others, Lord. Help us to do that well. Help us to understand how. Help us to understand who you are. Holy Spirit, make yourself known to those who don't know you this morning. Draw them in, Lord. 